So without further ado. <coughs> We have to set up new slides. Okay, before I get started, I want everyone in the last two rows to stand up. Stand up, come on, get, get yourself, stand up. And then please move to the first two rows. I'm not young anymore, my voice doesn't project back there. No, mostly I just want people to uh, kind of be more in a community feeling. If you're still in the last two rows, I'm not going to talk. Yes, good. Thank you for humoring me. That if you have a computer, I would like to ask you to either close it or just take notes. And the reason is going to be something I'm going to explain, which is that as CEO, you actually can't multitask. Uh, your brains can't multitask. And as CEO, if you are multitasking all the time, uh, you'll end up in a situation where you lose track of all of your priorities, your employees don't feel like you're present, and it has a lot of other issues. And so I would like you to practice this particular CEO skill of being present. And if you don't want to be present, just leave. That's okay. I won't be offended. But if you're here... <laughs> oh, well, this can be one of your two sessions. But if you're here, um, I ask you to be fully present. Okay. I'm going to get started. My name is Can June. It's like you open cans in June, so very straightforward. Um, a little bit about me. So, uh, you know, Joe mentioned that I scale Dropbox. My background is engineering. I was computer science and math at MIT. Um, and when I joined Dropbox uh, immediately after school, I joined as an engineer. And a year later, I became the chief of staff when we were about 200 people in 2012. Um, and over the course of two and a half years, we scaled Dropbox from 200 to 1,200 people. Uh, everything broke multiple times, and there were a lot of problems, and we solved a lot of them. Um, and I'll talk through some of the issues that I uh, saw and encountered during that time. <clears throat> After leaving Dropbox, I started Sorceress. Sorceress is an AI machine learning company. We build machine learning to make recruiting a lot more effective. And our goal is really to make it so that co companies find it a lot easier to build strong teams, whether they're young companies like the ones you're starting or bigger companies that exist in the world today. And so that people can find more fulfilling work. So that's what Sorceress does. Uh, we're at about 50 people, in, including a team of contractors. And yeah, I'm the CEO. I was there since the beginning, I guess. <laughs> um, so a word of warning, today I'm mostly going to talk about internal team scaling and scaling yourself. I'm not going to talk about how to scale a business. And the reason I'm not going to talk about how to scale a business is because there's actually a lot of content out there on scaling consumer startups, enterprise startups, et cetera. But nobody really talks about what's involved in scaling your team. And as CEO, you, know, you have to figure out your market. I don't know your market the way you do. Um, or as a founding team, I don't know your market the way you do. So I would not take any advice that I would give you about how to scale your company. Um, instead, you know, listen to your instincts on how to scale your company. So I'm going to talk about the business processes that are going to break, and those are consistent across every company um, or across many companies. One word of warning is that not every business is built to be scaled. You may start a startup, and it actually doesn't end up being a great VC-backed business. And in that, like, people ask me, you know, in what situations does a company make a great VC-backed business? There are a couple of different situations. One is you want a big market. VCs want to see a lot of return. And often, I actually see companies raise venture when they should, probably should not have raised venture. They're in a market that was not very big. And the VC will drive their business into the ground because they want to see growth. And so if you're going to end up starting a small, like low growth startup, don't raise venture funding unless you're pretty sure that you want to scale it really quickly. The second uh, factor of a market where you want to raise venture is in a market where there are winner-take-all dynamics. So Uber is actually a pretty reasonable market in which to raise funding because if Uber has a lot of money, they can outspend, acquire a ton of users, build this huge driver fleet. And by building a huge driver fleet, you have better network effects that allow your experience to be better. And so if I were starting Uber 2 today, it's hard for me to start Uber 2 because I don't have the supply of drivers. All the drivers are already on Uber. So that's what winner-takes-all means. <clears throat> and then the final thing uh, that would, in which case you'd want to raise venture, is if the upfront investment drives significant return. 
um, that is nonlinear. So if you're investing upfront in engineering like we are, and that allows you to like automate a human process, um, which is something that we're doing, once we automate the human process, then we can sell this thing for like you know hundreds of thousands of dollars a year, a year, and it's automated and doesn't cost us anything. Whereas for a normal human recruiter, it would cost you know a ton more money. And so in our case, you know, investing upfront in automation makes a lot of sense. It drives more return. But if you don't have a business where more investment would drive more return, don't raise venture money. So I think it's actually a uh, mistake for a lot of Silicon Valley folks to say, hey, you should always raise. VC money because you shouldn't. It doesn't always make sense. And you might have a business where it's a great business and you could just run it and let it and like hire someone to operate it and it'll throw off cash for you and that's awesome. Um, and if you raise venture, you might destroy it. That's number one. Number two is don't do any of this stuff before you have product market fit. Um, I'm going to talk about scaling a company be like beyond five people. Um, don't try to hire more than five-ish people before you hit product market fit. The market will actually tell you when you need to scale. So if you feel, I always tell people, product market fit feels like a strong pull from the market. You're getting this like, oh my god, I'm selling so much, I can't keep up. And that's what you want to feel. If you do feel that, then you want to hire more people and you want to scale. But if you feel like I'm like tr you know trying to sell things to people still, and I'm still trying to push things out, and like people are kind of skeptical about it, it may be that the market's not fully ready yet for your product, or your f your product is not 100% there yet. And so don't scale your company until you have product market fit. The reason is because if you scale too soon, and this happens to a lot of YC companies actually, they kind of scale during YC. It's not sustainable growth. They don't truly have product market fit. And what ends up happening is that they raise a bunch of money, they hire a big team, they burn a ton of money, and then they die. And they die because they try to scale too soon. They burn money before they were ready. And actually, uh, something that people don't tell you is that when your team is bigger than five people, it's actually really hard to pivot without destroying morale. And you don't want to be in a situation where you can't pivot, or it's like much harder to pivot. You want to be in a situation where you're still really agile and lean. So don't scale too soon. <clears throat> With that being said, what I'm going to tell you today is a ton of super tactical advice on all of these different topics. Um, one topic I'm not covering is fundraising. Happy to take any questions about fundraising at the end. I've done a bunch of fundraises for Dropbox and for Sorceress. And um, the tactical advice is going to feel very like detailed to you. Um, hopefully, some of it is helpful. I don't want to like give you really high-level, useless stuff. So. I'm going to dive right in. Um, real quick before I dive in, so what you will notice as you grow your company is that around each of these stages, everything in your company breaks. Like people will start telling you that everything sucks and like they don't know what's going on on the other teams and communication has broken down. They don't feel aligned anymore. They don't know what the goals are. They've lost track of the mission. This stuff always happens at every single stage. <laughs> don't worry if you get there. Um, it doesn't mean something is terribly wrong with your company. It just means that the processes that you've set up for the previous stage are not scaling to your current stage, and that's okay. You'll have to rebuild them at every one of these stages. Okay, so I only have two slides on product and go to market because, again, this is very unique to every single company. Um, but, real quick, most products don't sell themselves. Two ways you can fail are one, don't build a great product, two, don't distribute your great product. Um, a lot of founders, especially if you're an engineer, what I tend to see is that engineers are like, if we build it, they'll come. And uh, I don't like salespeople. I don't like the sales culture, so I'm not going to hire salespeople to sell it. And that is a mistake. I mean, if you want your, your company to be that way and not have salespeople, that's OK. But <clears throat> it's probably going to be hard to grow and distribute your product if you don't hire either a sales team or a growth team. It's on the enterprise side, a sales team. Um, and so. It, to distribute, you have to probably do some enterprise sales if you're on the enterprise side, or figure out the user acquisition loop that Joe was talking about on the consumer side. Um, you'll probably have to do some marketing at some point, and then hopefully you'll have some organic growth. Now, a lot of companies think like, oh, we have organic growth in the very beginning. It's great. It's going to sustain us forever. That's not how it works, unfortunately. Organic growth doesn't sustain you forever. And when you see companies experience exponential growth, it's not because they have organic exponential growth. That's not, it's not like magical uh, exponential growth. That doesn't happen by itself. What 
happens at these companies is that they layer on a ton of new levers every six, eight, 10 months. So um, let me give you an example, Airtable. I don't know if anyone uses Airtable, um, but Airtable recently raised at a really high valuation. They raised a lot of money and they've been very successful. But they actually, you know, in the beginning, they grow primarily organically, meaning they didn't have to pay very much for user acquisition. Now, uh, in order to sustain the level of growth that ne they need to sustain, like 25% month over month, they now are layering on new product lines, upsells, et cetera, more salespeople, new markets. And that's what allows them to keep that percentage growth even as the numbers get bigger. Because 25% at 10 million is much higher than 25% at 1 million. So you have to add, basically you have to add more stuff as your company gets bigger. That's all I have on product and growth like market. You can read the rest of the stuff online. There's a lot of blog posts. But OK, the next topic is scaling as CEO. Nobody talks about this. Um, but the CEO asked, actually has to live two years in the future. And uh, this is only true at the growth stage. It's not true in the product market fit finding stage. In the product market fit finding stage, you really have to live in the present. But as soon as you start to scale, you want to live in the future because your company, you need to lead your company from uh, the front and not from behind. And so you need to be ahead of where your company is going to be. <laughs> so you have to be thinking about like, what is the product going to be like a year or two from now? What is the market going to look like a year or two from now? Um, I say two years, probably in the beginning, it's like more like six months or one year. And then as you grow bigger, it gets longer. The horizons get longer and longer. A lot of thoughts on how to scale effectively as CEO. Um, I think actually the number one thing is self-awareness. So a lot of CEOs don't scale. A lot of founders who are initially CEO, they get replaced by their VC or they leave their company because they feel like they're not able to handle the team management, communication, et cetera, that's required as you get to a larger stage company. And so self-awareness, which is understanding like where you are, what your strengths are, what your weaknesses and areas for improvement are at a really honest level, um, really helps in helping you learn what you need to shore up on and then shore up on those things. Second thing I'd recommend is executive coaching and therapy. Actually, it turns out therapy is really useful. Um, it helps you deal with a lot of interpersonal and also personal kind of barriers. And having an executive coach helps you kind of uh, learn how to scale yourself to different communication needs as your company grows. The last four things are kind of four different areas that you will need to learn pretty, dis uh, pretty thoroughly. One is empowering other people. Um, as a new grad, you have never learned how to empower other people. You have only learned how to do stuff yourself. I only knew how to do stuff myself when I graduated and I went to Dropbox. But one thing you have to learn pretty quickly is how do I empower other people to be excited to do the job that I was doing? And it turns out that actually a lot of other people are excited to do the job that you were doing. This was a remarkable realization for me. Um, but it's awesome. It's super powerful. And in fact, other people are excited to do the things that you don't like to do. Um, so remember these things, and I'll give you some tactical advice on how to empower other people in a bit. The second one is learning how to facilitate conversations. So facilitation means you're not dominating the conversation, but you're listening to everything, and you're kind of trying to move things forward. And this is something that you can practice today. I would practice it in your team groups. When you come to disagreements, practice facilitation. There are also a ton of books on facilitation. Again, I would practice this skill. It is one of the most important skills as a leader to learn. <clears throat> and people, I think, learn it too late. They think that a leader needs to speak first, be direct, and be you know, the most opinionated. But actually, as a leader, being the best facilitator helps your team feel significantly more empowered. Third one is learning how to recruit and sell. Sales is a really important CEO skill. If you're a CEO, if you're a technical founder, that's OK. You don't have to learn how to sell as, as much, but it's still useful for recruiting. So people join your company, even though it's a stupid idea at the beginning, it you know, sounds crazy. People join your company because they believe you. And so you want to learn how to get them to believe you. So I'll talk more about how to learn sales later. And then finally, you have to learn how to manage people. So first, you have to manage uh, individual contributors, then you have to manage managers who are managing individual cont contributors, and then you have to manage executives. There are a lot of books on how to manage that I can share at the end, but that are much more tactical. So I won't go through how to manage. Okay, here are some situations in which the CEO doesn't scale. 
Um, if you can't delegate, if you don't learn how to delegate, you don't empower other people, you enable others by doing their job for them. This is something I did a lot in school, in team projects. When my team wasn't doing very well, I would do the project for them. That's a terrible idea. It doesn't work in the workplace. People just learn that you will do their work for them, and then they won't do any work. Don't do that. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, always living reactively in the present instead of thinking farther into the future. Um, this is where, uh, this is why I tell you like, don't type on your computer, don't multitask too much. Multitasking trains your brain to be super reactive. And when you train your brain to be super reactive, it's actually, it becomes very hard to be much more proactive and to think longer term. Some habits that I have found very helpful and I've seen in successful CEOs. Um, the number one thing is actually getting things done. There's a 15 minute blog post you can read on it called Getting Things Done in 15 Minutes. It's a system that allows you to capture all outstanding tasks, items, to do's, thoughts, et cetera. Put them in one place so that you, they are out of your head and so that you can be 100% reliable. As CEO, it's important to be extremely reliable, otherwise your team will not be reliable. Number two is inbox zero. Again, being extremely reliable in communication and in, in your deliverables so that your team will be extremely reliable. Number three is remembering what your goals are, your top three goals are. This is something you can practice today. So in your homework, some homeworks are more important than other homeworks. Uh, always know what your top three goals or priorities are. Deep work, you can read about deep work. It's actually important to do deep work as CEO because you need to learn how to uh, think more strategically about the company, the market, et cetera. <clears throat> Uh, number five is actually something that a lot of people fail to do and it causes a lot of chaos in their companies, which is when you say something twice, actually document it and document it in an, into an internal company wiki that everyone shares uh, so that everyone can see it. You don't have to say it over and over again. And then number six is appreciate everyone all the time. Tell them what they're doing well. And the reason for this, so number one failure mode I see in a lot of people is that they don't give positive feedback. And it's really bad if you don't give positive feedback and people are working for you because they don't know what they're doing well. And so they may either feel like they're not doing well or they try to do other things in order to make you feel good about their performance. Uh, but you might feel good about their performance already, so you should tell them. So one rule I have is to appreciate at least one person every day and give them specific feedback about what I like about them. You can practice this today, yeah. Yeah, inbox zero just means try to clear out your email inbox every day. Literally, like inbox. Literally inbox zero, yeah, yeah. It's very, again, these are very tactical. Um, and the reason why they're here is because being an effective leader means setting a good example for your team. And you want a team that is really execution oriented, good at executing, highly reliable, et cetera. And if you are not that way, your team won't be that way either. Yeah. Why when you say twice? That's <laughs> a good question. Why wouldn't you say it twice? Um, you could write it down if you say it once, but then you'll end up writing down a bunch of stuff that maybe you never have to repeat again. So twice means something more important, right? Twice means that more than one person needs to know about it usually, and that usually means that uh, you want to write it down so that other people can know about it as well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'll keep going. Okay, so this is about giving feedback. This is something you can practice today. Um, the most common failure mode I see in companies is you are a first time founder. You've not really, maybe not really managed people before. You hire someone you think is great. They start, you tell them what you want them to do. Like, please get us 35 customers over the next two quarters. They go and do that and then they come back and they like only got five customers. And you're like, what the fuck? I just told you to get 35. But they're like, well, my, my pet died, and my dad moved to Bulgaria, and I'm like, my family's not doing well. And you're like, man, I feel so bad for you. OK, I guess it's fine. That's really bad. Don't do that. Uh, because people often explain, oh, you know, this is an extreme example, but people will often give excuses for why they did a certain thing. And they, what happens if you tell them it's OK is that they will continue to disappoint you, which is not great. So what you need to learn is how to hold people accountable. Otherwise, you have to end up firing people. Not great. <clears throat> so how to hold people accountable. What I recommend instead is you read the book Nonviolent Communication, and you give them clear feedback. For example, you can say instead, hey, when we agree to objectives, 
and you don't deliver on them, I feel disappointed. And this disappointment makes me uh, believe that I can't trust you and that I can't give you more responsibility. And I don't want to be in that situation. So in order to ensure that I can trust you, I need you to let me know when you don't think you'll be able to deliver on a promise and for us to set new expectations at that time. Can you do this or what can we do to ensure that this happens in the future? So you have expressed you are disappointed with their performance and there is a path forward where you're not firing them immediately. That's good. So now they know, okay, if I deliver five customers and not 35, or if I don't meet my expectations, Ken June will be disappointed. Therefore, if I don't want to disappoint Ken June, what I need to do is tell her if something is going to happen that, uh, that is not what she expected or not what I told her to expect. And this enables you to have a high performing team. This also is important with your co-founders. So if you are setting clear expectations with your co-founders and they are disappointing you, you need to be very clear about this. Otherwise, what I see over and over again is that co-founder communication breaks down and then you end up in a situation where your co-founder is disappointing you over and over again. That's really bad. So if you have a team where you feel like someone is disappointing you, next time you meet as a team or next time you meet with them one-on-one, -on -one, practice giving them feedback. And I'll give you a... Uh, no, it's in a couple slides, but I'll give you a framework for how to give that feedback. <coughs> okay, the next thing we'll talk about is communication and culture. As I said, at every kind of milestone, um, typically around a fundraise, sometimes halfway in between fundraise, fundraises, everything breaks down. And so you have to rebuild every process again. There are a couple of communication habits that I think first time founders undervalue, and especially young founders undervalue. Um, and I'll go over them here. One is have a weekly all hands. Your employees want to know what's happening. So having a weekly all hands helps them feel like, hey, stuff is happening. The company's being led. I know what the goals are. So have an all hands every week. Um, solicit questions from, from people to answer during all hands. That's actually very helpful tactical advice. Two is have a wiki that everyone sees that has information everyone should know. Um, different companies are more or less transparent, but I err on the side of being significantly more transparent so that everyone has context for what's going on. This is actually really important. When people have good context, they make better decisions. And so you want to give people more context uh, by giving, having more transparency so that they make better decisions. Then uh, actually onboarding new employees and setting expectations with them is really important. Setting expectations means like, you know, the other uh, two days ago I onboarded someone new. And I walked through our onboarding process, which involves telling him about the mission, telling him about our values, telling him about communication norms, like don't at mention people directly on Slack except in these situations because we want to promote a deep work culture. <clears throat> so there are a lot of norms that you can set during onboarding, and that's often your only time to set those norms. And so don't undervalue onboarding. Do have weekly one-on-ones with everyone. I can give you a set of questions that you should ask during one-on-ones, but it's actually really helpful. Also make sure you have one-on-ones with your, with your co-founders um, because that really helps maintain the relationship. And then uh, do you have informal performance reviews, at least for the first you know, X years until you're like 25 people, then you should probably institute formal performance reviews. Um, this sounds like bureaucratic, but it actually turns out that people value getting feedback and getting thoughtful feedback on how they're doing and they wanna know. <clears throat> and then finally, give people constant feedback. Super helpful to be, give people constant feedback. One of my habits is to give, again, one piece of appreciation every day and one piece of negative feedback if I can find one every day. And I can share, again, how, we can, how you can give negative feedback in a way that's not hurtful. Any questions today so far? Should I take questions on every slide or at the end? Okay, that's fine. <laughs> So again, it's very tactical. Okay, here's how you run meetings effectively. There are a couple of different types of meetings. Every meeting should have an agenda. You should take notes, and you should probably share those notes with other people on your team if possible. And then every meeting should have action items. I see a lot of meetings where nobody has action items. At Dropbox, when we were about 200 people, we had uh, <laughs> pretty much no action items in any meeting. People would meet, and you'd be like, okay, what's next? And they're like, oh, I don't know. I, don't, well, I guess we'll meet again. That is ineffective, not good, don't do that. Um, and I actually think that Dropbox could have been a bigger company had we been more effective operationally. But yes, we instituted better meeting hygiene. So when you have meetings, always have next steps. <coughs> um, 
you've probably heard this from Jeff Bezos at Amazon, but I really like writing instead of talking, or not instead of, but writing more often than uh, talking. So for effective decision making, what you want is for your team or the person who needs a decision to write out the issue. So they'll write out the context, they'll write out all of the potential you know, pr pros and cons, everything they've explored, what the trade-offs are, and they'll circulate it with the team that needs to make the decision beforehand. And that team will give some questions and comments. And it's much easier to be thoughtful in, when you're reading and you're on your own and you're kind of like able to think about it in your head than it is to be thoughtful live in a meeting. So people are able to make better decisions this way um, because they're able to think about your document kind of on their own, in their own brain. Then you can write out the responses, bring it to the meeting, you can have to make a decision together, but at that point, everyone has context. And so you're able to be much more thoughtful about decisions that you make. Okay, uh, as you're growing, it's important to have values. If you look at Sorceress's jobs page, we have values on our website. Um, there's a reason why we have values. The reason is because as your team grows, you want your team to be able to make decisions, but you also don't want them to make decisions you feel are bad. And so one way to help them make decisions that are better and not bad is to uh, give them some guardrails for how they might make decisions. For example, one of our values is build strong relationships. And so if you are making a decision that would alienate you know, people and destroy your relationship with someone, I would encourage you not to make that decision internally. Because that's one of our values, people will think twice before they make a decision that would cause them to destroy relationships. <clears throat> and so um, values kind of help people guide their decision-making process. That's why it's useful to have when you're like five to ten people. And values represent your existing culture, so you don't want values co to come top-down from management. You want values to uh, be something that everyone contributes to, everyone has ideas on, and then you consolidate it over time. Yes? I'm on the value. So what's the like, normal or usual way for what companies do to generate their value? Is that from a group of people, workers, bottom up, top down? Because you said it's better not top down. Yeah, um, so I think what you'll find is that most companies reflect their founders. And so uh, even like no matter how hard I, tr I try, my company reflects all of my strengths and all of my weaknesses, unfortunately. Um, people, I guess people copy what I do. And so, um, it, it kind of ends up being the case that your values will represent whatever culture you have. Uh, sorry, your values will kind of, the culture you have will re uh, reflect your own values. And so I would recommend having them generated bottoms up. Um, but that being said, the final kind of the like buy-in process, the, the um, culling process um, of values should be done by you. So ultimately, like the values do get decided on by you, but the idea should be generated from everyone on the team. Um, you know, it doesn't have to take very long, but um, they'll change over time as you get to know your company better. So your company will change, and also you'll understand your values better. If you look on our website, the values are not the like values on the website are not the values we have today. They're pretty close but we've iterated on them since then. And the reason is because <clears throat> as we have grown, we've gotten to know ourselves, like our company culture better. We have fired people who are not a culture fit, which caused us to realize like, like oh, we shouldn't hire people like this. This should be a value. Um, and so it kind, you kind of like build awareness or self-awareness of your company's values over time. The process may be like, I don't know, an hour a week, three hours a week for like two or three weeks. It's not that bad. All right, so this is uh, my guidelines on how to give feedback, especially negative feedback, in a way that does not offend or cause the other person to be defensive and hopefully allows the other person to feel like they're being coached. I would recommend reading the book Nonviolent Communication. There's a bunch of fluff in it, but ultimately uh, it's actually really useful. What you should do is make an observation, state your feeling, state what you need, and then make a request. So. Let me uh, give you an example based on the conversation that I had with, uh, that, that we had earlier, where I was telling this poor performer that they didn't deliver on expectations. So when you don't deliver on what we agreed to is the observation. Like I observed that uh, we had set an expectation that you would deliver 35 customers and you delivered five. 
when this happens, I feel disappointed. And in order to trust you, I need to t you to tell me when your expectation, uh, our expectation is not going to be met. Next time, can you tell me ahead of time so that we can set new expectations together? So you can do this with your co-founder. If your co-founder is not delivering on expectations, um, you know, when, when we set a deadline for that project and you didn't deliver on that project in time, I felt disappointed. You can feel other things. I felt angry. I felt, um, uh, I felt uh, ashamed. I don't know, whatever it is that you feel. Then state what you need from them and what you would like to request from them. This is actually a really helpful thing to practice. Um, number one failure I see in startups uh, as they're growing, and instead, especially in startup management, especially in young founders, is that they don't know how to give feedback, and then their culture becomes dysfunctional. And you OK. I'm going to talk about goal setting and alignment. So as your company scales, you're going to have to set goals. Otherwise, people don't know what to do. And um, how are we doing on time, by the way? OK, cool. Uh, so in order to set goals, you want some transparency. There are a lot of systems out there. It really doesn't matter which system to use. There's like OKRs, KPIs, areas of responsibility. You can like look these up. But basically, as long as it is clear to people what they need to deliver on and other people know what each person's goals are, doesn't matter what system you use um, as long as it's clear and transparent. But uh, you'll probably start needing goals around like 12, 13 people. That's the point at which it becomes hard for everyone to know what el everyone is, else is working on unless you document it. Here's an example of OKRs, which is one type of goal setting system. Um, I like it. I've kind of adjusted it to fit our needs. You don't have to do it this way. <clears throat> OK, it's also important to track individual team goals, uh, individual goals and team goals. There are a lot of different systems for doing this. But basically, the point I'm trying to make is like, this is all super tactical. You can like look at these systems or whatever. The point I'm trying to make is at some stage of your company, around 10 or 12 people, you will need to have goals. And there are many startups that operate without goals. And then all the people at that startup are super confused because they don't know what to do. And they don't know what other people are doing. And this is bad. So make sure you have goals. It's actually really easy to forget to set goals <laughs> and for everyone to set their own goals. Recruiting is probably the number one thing you need to do as a founder. And there are a lot of different, actually, before we get into that, there are a lot of different elements of recruiting. There's like sourcing, interviewing, and evaluation, and then closing. And uh, again, I would encourage each of you to learn how to sell really well. Um, there are a bunch of books on how to sell well. You can read the books. You can practice in daily life. Some of you are naturally better at it than other people, but everyone can learn how to sell. It's not a super hard skill. It's just about knowing what the other person wants and then framing what you have in terms of what they want. These are some really tactical things that you can do in recruiting. So if you are trying to figure out who should be your co-founder, for example, um, or you're trying to figure out like how do you evaluate an engineer, uh, number one thing I would do is create a scorecard. Scorecard is, what does success look like for this person in the first 30 days, 60 days, 90 days? Write out a scenario or write out some uh, KPIs, per, like key performance indicators, or write out some metrics. Then ask yourself, what attributes does this person absolutely need to have? And which ones are nice to haves? You don't want to mix the nice to haves and the absolute needs to haves. For us, a values fit is an absolute needs to have. <clears throat> for example. And then to determine your interview process, you should ask yourself, what do I need to ask the candidate in order to get evidence of each attribute? And then what does good, OK, and bad look like on each attribute? Um, and then to be really like unbiased and systematic, you don't have to do this, but you can score each attribute, each candidate on every attribute individually. And then you can add up the scores. And some people will just have dramatically higher scores than other people. And it's very clear. Um, the failure mode I see here for a lot of first-time founders is that they kind of hire on gut. Like, this person seems like they'd be able to do a good job. Or they hire on pedigree. Like, this person went to Stanford, therefore they're probably decent. <laughs> or Cal. Ha, um, ha, ha, ha. <coughs> Just kidding. Um, and that's a mistake. I've interviewed a ton of Stanford people who I would never in 100 years hire. I would never hire them. They are totally incompetent, at least according to my standards. <laughs> oh, 
Oh god, I just I just realized that this is recorded. Well, anyway. Um, <laughs> They're gonna see you. <laughs> yes, they'll see. It's fine. So uh, make sure you know basically like make sure you know what you're looking for before you start looking for it. At least think about it a little bit. Don't hire on your gut. Um, actually, I had to let go of a bunch of people in the very beginning of the company because I did a bad job at this. So don't do a bad job. It saves you a lot of pain later, um, and then you'll have a better team. Here's a standard interview process. Um, often it's an initial kind of sell call, and then you have some sort of skills interview, whether this is like a tech screen or other type of skill interview. Then you bring them on site and you interview them in person for a day. Um, and there are some examples of things that you can do on site. Then you have reference checks. Um, my opinion is to always do reference checks, but I don't ask the candidate for references. During their on-site career history interview, we actually go through all the previous managers they have worked with, and then I will select a couple of them that I want to talk to and ask the person for their references to those managers. <coughs> so I always do basically references where um, I, I want to hear more from that reference not the reference that they provide me. You learn a lot of really interesting things in references. You'd be surprised how many managers would not recommend that you hire their <laughs> employee um, if you are able to kind of get to the root of, um, of some of the experiences that they described. And then finally, uh, you have to close the candidate. So at that stage, if you're making an offer to the candidate, um, you want to make sure that you're like selling them, that they're excited. Actually, in the initial sell call, you want to learn what they are excited about. And then write that down and make sure your team knows about it so that they can talk about that thing. So for example, if they really care about learning, make sure you write that down. And then your team can sell the candidate on the fact that like, your culture is super great at learning, if it is. If it's not, well, it's probably not the right fit. So write down their core motivator in the beginning. Um, here's how you design, here's how I design strong interviews. I know a lot of people do interviews in different ways. What I like to do is to use work samples as much as possible. So work samples are things where the candidate would do this stuff on site and it's really helpful. For example, for engineering, you probably want them to do real programming problems. Ideally, uh, we don't do whiteboard problems because they're not a good simulator for real life programming. Some people write faster on a whiteboard and some people write more slowly. Some people can't think in front of whiteboard. Instead, we have them in their own dev environment building something on their computer and we watch them. So use, I, we try to simulate like real life situations as much as possible. On sales, for example, you can have real pitch conversations. So one of the things I did for our sales um, guy is, <coughs> our sales interview process is I, um, I had an interview where for the first half hour, they can ask me anything they want about Sorceress. And then for the second half hour, it's a uh, what we call qualifying conversation, so initial sales call. And I role play myself as the customer. And I see how well did they understand Sorceress and how well did they uh, kind of like have this qualifying conversation with me. And it's night and day. Some people are just totally unable to do it. And if they can't do it, then I conclude like, you can't learn how to sell my product, so it's not a good hire. Um, there are other kind of things that you can do for other functions that are useful as um, work samples. And then finally, make sure that you actually standardize across interviewers. This is not a problem because you're inter right now because you're probably interviewing everyone if you start a company. But if you're, if you're like 10 or 20 or 30 people, you have to teach other people how to interview and you want to make sure that you have the same bar. So to have the same bar, it's actually very straightforward. First for a new interviewer, have them shadow you on four interviews. Then you shadow them on the next four interviews and you give them feedback on every one and you discuss the candidate after every one. This allows them to calibrate to you on each interview question. You want to do this for every single interview question so that new interviewers can calibrate. Again, very tactical. Okay, cool. Executives. I'll probably go through this section pretty quickly because um, you won't have executives for a while, but it's actually really <laughs> important to hire good executives. And around 20 people, you'll want to start thinking about hiring executives. Executives are experienced, typically ex more experienced people. They can run an entire function. They're part of your weekly leadership meetings. And you can tell them everything, <coughs> almost everything. In a rapidly growing company, unfortunately, uh, for folks who have never been in a rapidly growing company before, you probably don't know this, but your executives don't scale very well often. And you may have to replace them every 18 months. Um, which is kind of a pain, but it happens. And uh, I'll share kind of how to scale your executives. 
It's probably it's pretty hard to avoid executives um, not scaling, but in some cases, actually, they scale better to the next stage of growth. Now, the reason why a lot of executives don't scale is because their part, their like skill set is particularly good for a particular stage of growth. This is why you have to kind of end up replacing them. Um, and some people know, like, hey, I'm not going to scale beyond Series B. That's okay, and that's like an agreement that you have. Um, there are a couple different options. I prefer not to hire overqualified executives because they tend to be a little bit more demanding and less hungry, so less driven. Um, but often, overqual if an exec is overqualified, then they will definitely scale to the next stage because they've done that before. You can also set very clear expectations with the executive by saying, basically, like, hey, you know, 12 months from now, I had this conversation, um, 12 months from now, I need you to be able to do X, Y, and Z. Right now, I think you're pretty good at X and Y, but uh, I don't trust that you can do Z. I'd like to work on Z for the next 12 months together so that 12 months from now, you're able to do Z. <clears throat> and this goes into coaching them, which is giving them constant feedback on Z so that they know how well they're doing against your expectations of them. This is how you might be able to scale some of your executives. It's nice to be able to scale executives because they just have a lot of context on your company. They probably embody your culture. It also sucks to fire people. Um, but you might have to replace them, and that's OK. Yes? Uh, for the executives that don't scale after 18 months, how do you have that conversation like in the best possible way? Actually, in general, how do you fire people um, <laughs> while like, minimizing the amount of bridge burning you're doing? Yeah, great question. I've learned a lot about this. Um, so it's much easier to fire people if they know they're doing poorly. And so the first thing you have to do is uh, make sure that you're giving them feedback. So there are two situations. One, you've given them feedback. They know they're doing poorly, and then you have to fire them. Typically, if, they already, if you're already giving them feedback and they know they're doing poorly, then what you want to do is uh, set like something that's moderately measurable in terms of their per expected performance. And then if they're just not performing, you can be like, hey, we set these clear expectations. You're not performing, and I think it's most likely that you would find a better fit for your skill set somewhere else. Um, this is just not the right fit for you. So it's not about like you're bad, you suck at your job. It's like this is probably not the right fit for you. I would love to find some place that is a better fit for you. Um, now, if you haven't told people that they're doing a bad job and you feel like you need to fire them, this is a bad situation to be in. Um, it really sucks. Um, and I've, I know because I've done it before. Um, and this is why I'm telling you all of these things about giving people negative feedback. Please give people negative feedback. But if you do end up in, in that situation, um, I'd recommend saying something more like, I'd, what, I guess the first thing I'd recommend is like being like, hey, things are not going well. Um, here's why they're not going well. I'm sorry I haven't given you this feedback. Um, and if you feel like, you can say like, over the next four weeks, I'd like to work on an improvement plan. Here's what it looks like to me. How does that sound to you? If you don't feel like you can afford to keep having them for four weeks, you can be like, hey, things are not going well. I'm really sorry. Like, take responsibility. I'm really sorry. It's my fault. I didn't tell you. And um, I think it's not going to be a great fit. I know this is like a really negative surprise. Um, but I would love to help you find your next job. Yeah. Some people will not take you up on that. They'll be like, fuck you, and then leave. <laughs> it's OK. <laughs> yeah. Does that answer your question? OK. Cool. Yeah. There's a negative feedback. Do you believe in like, the whole sandwich format where people no, no, absolutely not. If you give a sandwich format, like nobody will hear your negative feedback. They will hear, like, things are going really well, and this thing could be a little bit better, but it doesn't matter because things are going really well. Do not give feedback in the sandwich format. That's why I recommended nonviolent communication. Um, this is the Steak only. <laughs> What'd you say? Steak format. <laughs> Steak format. <laughs> this is OFNR, which is basically I always, almost always, give negative feedback in this format. It is less biased. It doesn't accuse them of something. It just tells them what I observe and how I feel. Um, and that's why I use this particular framework. It's really helpful. Yeah. So let's say, for example, if they're doing certain things right and others wrong, how can you not give them positive and negative feedback? Yes, I give them positive and negative feedback, but I will not do it in a sandwich. So I will say, like, here are the things you're doing well. I love that you launched this on time and you set up these processes. There are some areas for improvement that I'd love to work with you on. Here are the areas for improvement. Um, you know, I had, uh, for example, um, 
I've observed that there are these three things that happened recently, and it makes me it makes me think like maybe um, I could help you be more of a systems thinker. And so, <clears throat> for you know, for your job, for you to be really effective at your job and the next stage of your job, you need to be a really good systems thinker and think a little bit more strategically about the system. And so that's um, so as a result, like. Um, I'd love to work with you on how to learn some elements of systems thinking. So that's how I'd give the negative feedback. Very rarely do I say something like, um, this was just really bad. Like, I would love, you know, it made me lose a lot of trust in you, and I would love to make sure that this kind of stuff doesn't happen again. Someone else had a question. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about also? Can you define what means for you and how much into consideration do you take when you hire people? Sorry. Uh, can you define what culture means to you and how much do you take culture into consideration when hiring people? Yeah, great question. How much do I take culture into account when hiring people and what does culture mean to me? Um, culture is really just our values. Uh, we have six values and they are, um, I hope I can say all six. <laughs> get shit done, do the right thing, have good judgment, grow toward excellence, um, build strong relationships, and put other people's needs above your own. And for each value, we have assessment criteria. Like, you know, there's evidence of, this, of the person exhibiting this value if X, and these are some red flags of the person not exhibiting this value. Um, and so during the hiring process, uh, we, during the hiring process, we make sure that like throughout kind of on the onsite and also kind of throughout we're taking notes on how well is the candidate uh, fulfilling what we believe our values to be. That's the only thing I'd really consider as culture. Um, there's stuff like, I don't know, some people are like culture is offsites or like common hobbies. I don't really believe any of that stuff. Yes. Um, so as your company go from just five person, five people to like 100, how do you kind of still keep this flat structure? and kind of like convey, convey the value across like 100 people instead of just five? Yeah, good question. So I think one common misconception is that companies need to be very flat. Um, I don't think that companies actually need to be that flat, but what's important is that communication happens very immediately up and down the chain. Um, we have now like managers who manage managers who manage people. And, um, and the most important thing is, I think I mentioned, a goal setting process like this where everyone in the company can see everyone else's goals. This helps people understand like, oh, this function is responsible for XYZ goals. This function is responsible for ABC goals. These people are working on these different types of goals. Um, so I think the value of flatness is that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. People feel empowered. Actually setting, you know, having people set their own goals helps achieve the same goals without um, having to maintain a super flat structure. Super flat structure has a lot of negative downsides, like a manager might have 20 direct reports. If a manager has 20 direct reports, they cannot take care of the needs of all of these direct reports. Um, I think like seven to 10 is roughly the breaking point, and so it's hard to keep a flat structure. Someone else had a question. I have a question. Yes. How did you hire the first person? How did I hire the first person? Before raising any money, <laughs> yeah. Let me think. How did we hire the first person? We didn't hire anyone for a while. So you were working alone? Uh, I have a co-founder. Okay. Yeah. How did you find your co-founder? My co-founder and I have been friends for a long time. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we actually started a previous company together. So after the third guy. How about the third guy? Uh, so the third employee. So it was me and my co-founder for a while. And we work together to basically validate, is there a market here, and is our product hypothesis correct? So we simulated our product as much as possible. Then um, when we brought on a first engineer, that was actually after our pre-seed. So we raised a pre-seed round of like 500K, um, and that allowed us to start hiring more employees. Okay. So uh, I think your question is like, how do you convince them to join you when yes, it's so yes. early? Give them a lot of equity. Um, it's useful if they're your friend and you give them a bunch of equity. Um, we also actually hired, so my co-founder is, uh, has been programming since he was like 10, 12, something like that. So he's a super experienced engineer. 
And so he was able to build a lot of stuff. Um, also, I have an engineering background. That helps a lot. Um, and he was also, some of our early hires were actually international engineers. Um, so when they're international, you know, there are not a lot of other opportunities. I happen to have a co-founder who was really able to manage remote engineers effectively. Yeah. Yeah. So it's helpful. Otherwise, hire your friends. <laughs> You mentioned um, a couple slides ago that you have like some must-haves and some of the nice-to-haves. Um, for you personally, what are those like in a co-founder, and what I guess made you choose your co-founder specifically for, for this? Hmm, that's a really good question. Um, let me try to answer it on the spot. Just a sec. No, it's okay. <laughs> I love questions like that. Um, so for my co-founder, I think couple things were really important. One is they compliment me. Um, and actually, my friend and I, we had known for a while that we complimented each other really well and kind of talked about starting a company together. Um, and so that's like, I'm fairly outgoing. I am not a great engineer. Like, I studied computer science. I did some engineering. But like, compared to him, he's been programming for 20, 25 years, you know, 20 years. Um, so he's a much better engineer. and. Um, I'm great at talking to customers. I'm like great. I was a product manager at Dropbox, and so I like do product stuff. Um, he can build anything, like literally anything, and so we felt like that was a good combination. Also, um, he like I'm fairly like outgoing and like enjoy people, and he's like a little bit more introverted, and so we kind of learn from each other. He's like a super structured first principles thinker like typical engineer, <laughs> and um, I bring a little bit more like feelings, touchy-feely stuff into our conversations. And so we balance each other out, and that's a nice amount of diversity. So that was one thing I looked for was someone who complimented me. Other important must-haves are like, do I trust them with my life? Um, seriously, really important, because uh, you'd be really surprised how many companies die because the co-founders split up or they have like some terrible disagreement. And so choose your co-founders co very wisely. Um, and I felt like, this, like I trust this person with my life. Um, Jeff Bezos has a great metric, which is like, how likely is this person to get me out of a third world country prison? Um, so I felt like my co-founder would get me out of a third world country prison with like reasonably high uh, probability. So I felt like it, would, it could be a good fit. Um, he's also, so one thing I care a lot about is conscientiousness. Um, in the big five personality test, conscientiousness means that uh, you will do what you say you'll do, you're very reliable, um, et cetera. And that, for me personally, is a very important value. Um, and then the final thing is being super focused on growth. Um, so having a strong growth mindset, being really into self-improvement, being very systematic and able to self-improve, um, those, those were like some of the important things. I guess the last thing that I don't even think about but is like a default for people I enjoy being around is having a high sense of agency. So sense of agency means that you feel like you can do what you set out to do and like you feel like you can do anything. Yeah. Yes. So um, in terms of what, how do you relinquish that and still feel like, OK, you haven't given out too much. How do you relinquish equity? Yeah, and you feel like you haven't given out too much and like that. How do you determine? <laughs> yeah, great question. It depends a lot on the particular individual. So my co-founder and I are a 50-50 split. Um, but again, like we have a super strong trust relationship. Sometimes that's not the right split for a company or to a pair of co-founders. For the first employee, uh, if they're super experienced, they might ask for like three, four, five percent, um, and that's now normal. <clears throat> um, if they're not super experienced, like maybe less than that. Uh, but it really depends on like how far along are you with your company. Uh, my general philosophy is like it doesn't matter how much equity I give out. Really, like either it's worth something or it's worth nothing. Um, and something is always better than nothing, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. And if I believe this person will make the company successful, then I'll give them. Sorry, this is a follow-up. So let's say, for example, that that person is super experienced. You say, you know what, I feel good 5%. Does that, do you split that, let's say, so between you and your co-founder, 2.5%, 2.5%? Yeah. So tactically, when you start a company, you, uh, it, you will issue shares to both founders. 
And then you will open up a stock option pool, um, which is uh, typically like 15, 10, 15%. Um, that stock option pool is now allocated to all employees. Like employee options are allocated out, to, out of that stock option pool. Um, if you, and so when you start that stock option pool, it always dilutes you and your co-founder equally. Yeah. And basically all future dilution events will dilute you and your co-founder equally unless you have some like weird legal terms that I would not recommend. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I'm going to finish real quick and then I'll answer remaining questions. Um, okay. Scaling executives, how do you know your execs are good? Um, you want to make sure your executives are almost like co-founders. They want to act as, you want them to act as owners of the company. They should be able to independently run with their whole function. So sales, marketing, customer success, engineering, et cetera. Um, and your company success is their number one priority. If they care about their career more, it's probably not a great fit. So there's one last thing I want to say, which is that uh, it's actually really hard to start a company. Um, things really suck sometimes, and I think I, I tend to be a little bit more open about like sometimes things just suck. Even if the company is going super well, like Sorcerer is doing super well, you know, we just raised, um, it still sucks sometimes. And like some days I just don't want to get out of bed. And so it's really hard, <laughs> and I would recommend like don't start a company in a space that you're not passionate about. If you don't care about your product, it's not going to get you through all of this stuff. Um, do start a company if there's something that you do care about or um, if there's something you think you will care a lot about over time. But it's hard, so you need that to get you through stuff. Last thing. Um, all, all that being said, Sorcerers is hiring. You can go to our jobs page. Hopefully you enjoyed this. I'll answer all the questions. These are some people that we are hiring for. We are a real machine learning team. Um, we do have a lot of machine learning infrastructure. We are potentially hiring one or two interns this summer, and then definitely full-time engineers. Um, and then a couple actually full-time folks on the business side. So if you're not an engineer, potentially could be a good fit. Um, I like new grads and young people. <laughs> so um, I think I'm pretty good at coaching people, all the feedback and everything. So uh, that's something that's kind of my bias. Um, and then uh, the other roles for machine learning engineer, you actually don't need to have a ton of machine learning expertise. You just have to be a good programmer. 95% of machine learning is engineering. So we can teach you the stats. It's fine. <clears throat> All right, cool. Other questions? <laughs> well, thank you. Hopefully, you hopefully can implement a bunch of this even today with your co-founders and your friends. OK, there were more questions. Yes. How many people do you directly manage right now, and how much time do you spend each week meeting with them? Uh, that's a good question. I think I currently manage five people, five or six on that order, and I have mostly 30-minute one-on-ones with people. Um, I meet with uh, new people three times a week so that they onboard well until, the, until I feel like they're doing well. Um, and then sometimes, so with my co-founder, we have a two-hour dinner on Sunday night. And then, um, just because we need more time together, we also have a 30-minute sync in the middle of the week. Um, and then with some employees who are more like executives, I sync with them for an hour. Yeah. And just follow up. So what kind of questions do you ask during the one-on-one -on -one meetings? Yeah, one-on-one -on -one questions. Um, so you can find good lists of them online. What I like to have is a document where we document every one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and a lot of uh, my one-on-ones are like, uh, like tactical business stuff. So we have what we call a topic stack where we add like thoughts and things we want to discuss to it throughout the week as we're going through the week. And then during our one-on-one, we'll first go through the topic stack. And then I'll also have like personal growth one-on-ones where we'll go over like how are, you, how are things going for you? What, how do I think things are going for you? I ask employees to come and always ask for feedback during every one-on-one. Um, and then, so I'll give them feedback. Um, I'll ask them how things are going. What is going well? What could be better? How can I better support you in doing your job? Are there any changes that need to be made to your expectations? Um, do we still feel like we're on track for goals? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Yes? Could you make any recommendations on how to successfully empower people? Mm, recommendations on how to successfully empower people. So, for me, in my experience, if you hire people who are um, like 
relatively driven to do a good job. Like everyone here is probably relatively driven to do a good job. If you hire people who are relatively driven to do a good job, um, then you don't need to motivate them as much. <clears throat> They'll just be naturally motivated, which is great. Um, and then to empower them, you want to do some things and not do other things. So I'll start with the not do things first. Um, don't micromanage them. This does not mean don't give them feedback, uh, but it does mean like if they do something, don't redo it without telling them. So that's really annoying. <laughs> it's disempowering when your boss redoes your work and doesn't tell you that it was bad. Um, also other stuff like don't enable them. So uh, enablement means like the person did something you don't like of what they did and you say it's okay, like that's fine, um, you know, don't worry about it. That enables them to continue to do a bad job, which is not good. Um, get, do agree on goals that you both agree on. So every month, two months now, uh, we have a goal setting one-on-one -on -one where we have like an entire OKR thing and each person has their own OKRs. And so it should be pretty clear to them what they need to do. If, that's, if it's not clear what they need to do, then that can be disempowering. Um, so make sure they, on the like do side, make sure they have goals, make sure you give them positive and negative feedback pretty regularly, at least during your one-on-ones, if not throughout like your interactions. For me, I try to give feedback, feedback to people as immediately as possible. Um, so you just have to get kind of get used in, get, get used to the habit of giving specific positive and specific negative feedback. <laughs> um, people also are empowered when they feel like they're learning and growing often, like most people do. And so making sure that you make space during your one-on-ones for you to talk about like what are areas for growth, how can we support, how can I support you in those areas for growth? For example, uh, one of the members of my team, uh, he's going to have to be a manager. And so I asked him to read a book called High Output Management, which actually I'd recommend to everyone here. Um, and as he, I told him, like during our one-on-ones, it's going to be a book club. Every week, we're going to review what you learned from high output management and apply it to your day-to-day -day work. So far, it's been working super well. So there's like kind of systematic coaching like that that you can do that is very empowering. Um, but first-time founders, first-time managers, often what they will do is micromanage. Um, so this is what parents often do with their children. Like, don't do that, do that, don't do that, do that. It's like kind of annoying. Um, so you can set the expectation that in the first three or four weeks, you're going to micromanage a lot and give them a ton of feedback. And then after that, you will trust them to do stuff on, your own, on their own. So as long as you set that expectation, then they know like, oh, okay, like I'm still in the learning process. That's okay. I'll take one more question. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. Uh, you mentioned uh, some books that you recommend. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of books actually. Um, I can compile a list and send it to you guys. But off the top of my head, high output management, which I mentioned, nonviolent communication, which is on feedback. Crucial conversations is also about communication. Difficult conversations, also about communication. <laughs> Turns out communication is like the number one thing that you have to do as a CEO. Um, radical candor, which is on management. Um, what else has been life changing? Uh, never split the difference. Um, if you're doing any sales, the challenger sale is really good. Um, aside from that, I can think of more books, yeah, and send you guys. I read a lot. I'd recommend reading a lot. It's really helpful. <laughs> yeah. All right. Oh, thank you.